Today's video is all about the origin of species, which encompasses the idea of macroevolution, which is part of Unit 7 in AP Biology. Hey guys, this is Mikey from AVO Prep Academy, and on this channel, we cover AP Biology content. Today's video will largely overview chapter 24 of Campbell Biology, which deals with the idea of speciation as a bridge between microevolution and macroevolution. In a previous video, we discussed microevolution as defined by a change in allele frequencies over time. Macroevolution, on the other hand, is the broader pattern of changes in species we observe across much larger expanses of time. But like an 8-bit painting, or a mosaic, which becomes increasingly hard to see as we zoom in, the same could be said about the linkage between microevolution and macroevolution. So today, we'll try and tackle that challenge and gain a better understanding of how microevolutionary processes can lead to speciation and thereby explain the patterns of macroevolution that we see. And here is an outline of how we'll explore today's topic. One, what is a species? Two, the importance of gene flow. Three, speciation. Four, reproductive barriers and five, hybrid zones and the time course of speciation. Let's begin. The first part of this chapter explores the concept of species. At first glance, it seems like such a simple concept. I know I'm human, and I know my dog's a dog. And while these clear points of distinctions can come to us pretty intuitively, the reality is that we all exist on a spectrum of genetic differences. And because I'm more of a plant guy, I'm sure there would be a fruit fly scientist out there who'd be very upset with me if I were to confuse Drosophila melanogaster with Pseudo obscura. But whatever the case may be, the truth is that it's actually pretty hard to define what a species actually is. Intuitively, we might consider species to be sort of a kind or a type of an organism, but as mentioned just now, things can get pretty challenging when we try to create strict definitions to clearly delineate between two seemingly similar organisms. So in this chapter, we're going to be using primarily the biological species definition, which defines the species as the following. A biological species is a group of organisms that has the potential to interbreed in nature and produce viable, fertile offspring. So a couple of things to talk about here. The idea of potential to interbreed stems from the fact that a raccoon in New York may not practically be able to breed with a raccoon in Texas, but they do have the potential to do so. And the second important note is that raccoon babies that they produce must be viable, as in have the capacity to survive and live, and also be able to produce more raccoon babies of their own, like an infinite raccoon hat. So this seems to work pretty well. I'm a human because I can have more human babies with another human, while dogs couldn't really do that with other humans. But they could have more puppies with other dogs who'd grow up to be dogs that could produce even more puppies. But while this definition seems pretty foolproof, there are few limitations. For instance, because this definition relies so heavily on the idea of interbreeding, you couldn't really use it for asexually reproducing species like bacteria. Also, there's just no way of knowing how mating outcomes would have been for extinct species found only in fossil records. So for those other tricky situations, we often use other species concepts, with the morphological species concept being a common one found on the AP exam as well. But simply put, morphological species concept uses features, traits, or the general morphology of an organism to categorize them into distinct species. This would work well for extinct species and even bacteria who could be categorized by their shape and proteins found on their cell exteriors as well. But for the purpose of this chapter in describing how speciation works, we'll be working with the biological species concept. So let's go with that definition for the time being. Ah. So now that we know what a species is, we can begin to think about what it is that holds us together as a single interbreeding species. One simple way to approach this question is by asking why it is that humans and other humans can produce viable human babies. So back in Unit 5, we learned a bit about the human karyotype, which contains 23 pairs of chromosomes for a total of 46. During fertilization, 23 chromosomes of the sperm cell is joined with the 23 chromosomes of the egg cell, which then forms a proper diploid zygote. I think we can make an argument here that the correspondence between the 23 chromosomes of one gamete and the 23 of the other gamete creates a compatible diploid chromosomal set that could begin working together toward building a viable and a fertile individual. We can also look at the other side of this coin as well. Dogs have 78 chromosomes in total, resulting in their gametes with 39 chromosomes in their haploid number. Cats have 38 chromosomes in total, with 19 being their haploid number. So even if we were to somehow merge their gametes together in some weird science experiment, these chromosomes would not be able to find their homologous counterparts. And of course, the difference in their numbers of chromosomes would result in a cell with completely discordant chromosomal sets. So ultimately, it's about genetic similarities that allow individuals 
individuals of a single species to reproduce with the similarity encompassing features like the number of chromosomes, sizes of those chromosomes, and the placement of genes along those chromosomes, and so on. The idea is that continuous gene flow that occurs across generations allows the chromosomes and their respective genes to be, in a sense, compatible within the population. So then, what would happen in the absence of this gene flow? In this part of the video, let's explore how the restriction of gene flow can result in speciation using an example. Let's imagine for a moment that in a coastal region, there exists a species of interbreeding plants that we would consider to be a single species for all intents and purposes. Let's imagine that across some geological time scale, a mountain forms in the middle of what would be a continuous population range. Now, the thing about mountains along a coastline though, is that they tend to produce something called a rain shadow, where the moist air coming in from the oceans rain down on one side of that mountain, while the other side becomes extremely dry. If you live in Washington state, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. But with this situation, a couple of things are happening. One is that due to the geographical barrier, the gene flow is effectively cut off between these two separated populations of plants. And two, due to the differences in the environments on either side of the mountain, these flowers on opposite sides would face different selectional pressures. For instance, the plants in the arid region may develop deeper roots to access water, an adaptation commonly seen in desert plants, and the plants in the wet region may develop particular traits adapted to living in an environment that's abundant in water. Whatever the case is, we could imagine that selection would affect these two plant groups very differently. But here's the most important part. Selection acts on the genes. So alleles that are favored on one side of the mountain may not be favored on the other side and vice versa. And to add some more seasoning to this story, we can then throw in all of the other microevolutionary mechanisms, such as mutation that occur on one side of the mountain that would never reach the other side. And that would even include chromosomal mutations that could alter the size and numbers of chromosomes and even the positions of genes within them. Ultimately, without gene flow, any changes incurred in one group of plants would never be mixed in, so to say, with the other group, resulting in a gradual but certain divergence of genetic similarities between the two populations. And maybe one day you may observe these plants side by side in a garden and never know that they were ever the same species. So it seems pretty clear that that what we've just demonstrated is an example of how microevolutionary events, given that they occur independently in isolated populations of a one single population, could result in speciation given enough time. And it's also evident from this example that a restriction of gene flow through geographical barriers, as exemplified in this diagram too, is a sure shot way to kickstart this process of speciation. In fact, this type of speciation is called allopatric speciation from the words allo meaning different and patric meaning land or country country in reference to the restriction of gene flow due to some geographical barrier. But it turns out that you don't always need a geographical separation to get speciation. In sympatric speciation, we observe restriction of gene flow even within a single geographical region with no physical barriers to reproduction. Now, sympatric speciation is tricky, but the most important question to keep in mind is this. What type of intrinsic barriers to interbreeding could exist even within a shared region? Well, there are a few that you should know for this course. The first is habitat differentiation, and it has a great story to go along with it. Our main species of interest is the American apple maggot fly. Well, that's what they're called now. But 200 years ago, these flies mostly parasitized the fruits of North American hawthorn trees, laying eggs in them and having the maggots grow up eating the developing hawthorn fruits. But when European settlers colonized North America, they brought with them apple seeds, which they planted alongside the hawthorn trees due to their similar growing requirements. Now, just like any population of living things, this newfound apple tree presented a new resource that the maggot flies could expand into and exploit. And that's exactly what many of these flies did. But here's the thing, apple fruits mature earlier than the hawthorn fruits. And believe it or not, the success of the fly maggots was highly dependent on the timing of laying the eggs in the developing fruits, which meant that flies that genetically happened to produce eggs earlier were favored in the population that migrated over to these apple trees. This temporal isolation of the original hawthorn population and the apple population led to a difference in the timing of mating and the laying of eggs, that pretty much segregated what was once a single population into two separate populations that interbred less and less over time, becoming two species through this habitat differentiation facilitated by temporal isolation.
The second mechanism of sympatric speciation could be sexual selection. As we've learned in microevolution, sexual selection is a mechanism through which female mate choice can drive certain features to become more prevalent or exaggerated over time. So how does sexual selection drive sympatric speciation? In an African species of cichlids, scientists were interested in the noticeable difference between males of two species, P. pundamilia and P. nirere. It always appeared that females of each species mated with the males of its own species, which should be no surprise. What was weird though, was that when females were presented with these males under monochromatic orange light, they didn't really seem to prefer one male or the other, often confusing the opposite species as its own. What this demonstrates is that female mate choice in choosing certain features of males could act as a reproductive barrier. This type of mating would produce males that look like the fathers and daughters who make the same choice as the mothers, thereby separating a potentially single population into two subgroups of individuals who only mate within that group, often due to superficial features. The third mechanism is alloploidy. This is not at all common in animals who have very specific chromosomal structure requirements, but more common in plants. But to be frank, the AP Bio curriculum isn't all that interested in plant genetics as it can get very esoteric extremely quickly. So we'll skip this one for this video. Now that we've talked about the big picture stuff, both allopatric speciation and sympatric speciation, let's take a look at the reproductive barriers that work to reinforce these speciation events, some of which we've already discussed. Here we divide reproductive barriers into two major types, prezygotic barriers that inhibit the formation of the zygote altogether, and postzygotic barriers which still inhibit the convergence of two species back into a single species even if a zygote were to form. Let's take a look at the prezygotic barrier first. The first one on the list is habitat isolation. Here it's pretty much channeling the idea of allopatric speciation, with populations that live in completely different habitats, for instance an aquatic snake species and a terrestrial one, it's pretty clear that they wouldn't be found hanging out at the same place at the same time to mate, so that one is pretty straightforward. Second is temporal isolation, where two species or populations have different times at which they breed. For instance, birds and their mating seasons, or these cute skunks that either mate in summer or winters, well, it would inhibit their interbreeding because they wouldn't be doing it at the same time. Another one is behavioral isolation. Here we focus on things like mating calls, dances, or other mating rituals performed by organisms. Between two non-interbreeding species, chances are good that they wouldn't recognize the suggestive mating behavior of a completely different species. This is very common with things like bird songs and pheromone reception. But let's say that all those things were actually overcome like two species live in the same area, they mate at the same time, and maybe they even have similar behaviors to entice each other into a mating attempt. Well, here we see two additional isolating mechanisms that can take effect after this mating attempt. First is mechanical isolation. And as the name suggests, this is a situation in which the two individuals of two distinct species mechanically don't work with one another. For instance, the swirling patterns of these two snails run in opposite directions, which apparently doesn't allow them to copulate. Now, I, I'm not sure really how that works, and I'm not about to watch snail videos to find out for the sake of knowing what that is, but you get my point. The next mechanism is a bit more interesting. Here we see gametic isolation. Now recall that gametes refer to those haploid cells that are involved in sexual reproduction, otherwise known as sperms and the eggs. What we see in gametic isolation is the incompatibility of these gametes such that the sperm would not be able to fertilize the egg. This would be very common in a aquatic organisms because they have external fertilization, wherein the females lay eggs and males simply fertilize them in a rock crevice or something like that. In any case, because mix-ups can happen from time to time, gametic isolation, say between two similarly related sea urchin species, can block interbreeding, thereby reinforcing that species barrier. Okay, but let's imagine that the two species are so similar that even the sperm cells of one can fertilize the eggs of another species. What then? Here too, we have three additional barriers that exist. First is reduced hybrid viability, wherein the hybrids that do form only live for a very brief period of time before dying early. Then we get reduced hybrid fertility, which is exactly what we observe with mules and ligers, wherein the hybrids are pretty strong and viable, but they cannot produce babies on their own, which is still why we consider tigers and lions and donkeys and horses to be different species. Lastly, we get hybrid breakdown, seen more often in plants where the hybrids are both viable and fertile, but only for a set number of generations before they become sterile. But at this point, I should remind you that it's not like nature is trying to keep species from converging. It's just that with enough genetic differences between these populations, 
Even if they're similar, there are sufficient incompatibilities that result in these hybrid frailty, cellular incompatibility, or even behavioral differences that simply happened from these differences in genes. But let's say that two populations are so similar that none of those barriers prohibit interbreeding. Well, then they're single species anyway, so we can definitely draw a line here in the sand to differentiate the two species from one by analyzing these reproductive barriers, at least when using the biological species concept. Great, now let's take a look at what we've just mentioned, two populations that are in fact the same species. But if they were to just begin their divergence, what are the potential outcomes here? The book mentions three, reinforcement, fusion, and stability. As this image shows, reinforcement would strengthen whatever reproductive barrier that began the divergence process, thereby increasing the likelihood of speciation in time to come. In fusion, whatever was blocking interbreeding is lifted. For instance, a potential allopatric speciation event that is ended when a land bridge forms between the two isolated populations, reconnecting them all together again. And lastly, we have stability, wherein continued production of hybrid individuals would form between the two populations without further divergence or conversions. But let's just suppose that we have reinforcement and the two populations are in fact diverging. The last part of this chapter deals with the heated debate that lasted for much of the second half of the 20th century between Richard Dawkins and Stephen Jay Gould. The crux of their argument was about the time course of speciation, as in just how gradual or rapidly does speciation take place. Richard Dawkins largely championed the idea of phyletic gradualism, where he described the process of speciation occurring through small incremental changes that occur across larger expanses of time. On the other hand, Stephen Jay Gould was a proponent of punctuated equilibrium, where species would largely remain unchanged for long periods of time, only to rapidly change when environmental pressures changed in a punctuated manner. Gould's theory was largely used to explain the absence of transitional forms within the fossil records, as he was a paleontologist himself. But just keep in mind that even Gould's punctuated equilibrium was defined in the context of the geological timescale, meaning that the rapid evolution evolution that he mentioned would still have taken tens, hundreds of thousands, or even millions of years to still unfold. Today, we acknowledge that both Dawkins and Gould were right. We have seen evidence of rapid evolution, particularly with chromosomal anomalies that could even create new species within a couple of generations, but we also absolutely see fossil records of gradual changes at shale sites that supports Dawkins' ideas too. And with that, we conclude chapter 24 on macroevolution. And for the unit seven of AP Bio, there's just one more thing that we have to learn, which is how to create and analyze phylogenetic trees. And we'll see you in that video too, I hope. If you found this video helpful, drop a like, leave a comment, and subscribe for more content just like this one. And don't forget to share this video with your fellow homo sapiens. This has been Mikey with Avo Prep Academy. We'll see you in the next video.